In this topic, we're going to be covering HAL's advanced compositing tool. With advanced effects enabled, the effects menu looks somewhat different. Under preferences on the full page menu, advanced compositing tools can be switched on and off. First, I'm going to go into the color correction menu. Under advanced compositing, the color correction menu is laid out slightly differently. It also contains additional features. Under Luma, the luminance characteristics of the video image can be adjusted, such as contrast, brightness, and gamma, which controls the brightness of the midtones in the image. To return the values to normal, select Reset All. Posterization can also be turned on and adjusted under the Luma menu. The Chroma menu allows the adjustment of the chrominance characteristics of the video image, such as saturation, hue rotation, and CYX. To explain CYX, I'm going to use a diagram. I'm now going to use the hue rotation function to rotate the hues 180 degrees. We notice while the hues have been rotated, the luminance values remain the same, resulting in an incorrect hue rotation. CYX rotates the luminance characteristic of that colour separately from the hue characteristic. To lock hue and CYX together, select the AND function. So now when hue is rotated, CYX is rotated in sympathy. HAL's standard effects menu allows the masking of the color correction effect using the keyer. Under advanced effects, a similar effect can be achieved using selective. Here, I'm going to use the more function to select the red flowers in this image. I'm now going to select saturation value of zero to return the selected color values to grey. So now I'm going to select more until all of those values are included. Adding softness will increase the range of colors that are selectively desaturated. Color match allows the precise matching of colors. I'm going to select the start color by highlighting the from box and selecting a red component of the image. If I want to change red to cyan, I'm going to now place the destination color or the required color in the to box. So now the hues are rotated to achieve the color matching. We can also use gain to achieve the color matching by using the scroller bar and sliding down to gain. We can also use cast to achieve the same effect. I can use the selective function together with color match to turn the red flowers into blue flowers.
The cast function works in a similar way to the standard HAL effects menu. Here we can adjust the overall red cast, plus or minus, along with the green and blue cast values. An additional function called null cast can prove useful in white balancing material which was shot with a poor white balance setting on the camera. This shot was not properly white balanced, resulting in the white components of the picture, such as this post, being stained green. If I select Null Cast and press on an area of the picture which should be white, I can immediately white balance the shot in post-production. Advanced Effects also contains some very powerful colour correction tools called Colour Fettel. These can be accessed by selecting Graph. Alternatively, pull down on the thumb control of the grip whilst in the colour correction menu to access the Fettel graphs. To use Colour Fettel effectively, some understanding of the YUV components of video is required. I'm going to use a diagram to explain YUV. Y describes the luminance component of the video image, whilst U and V refer to the colour balance components of the video image. U describes the balance between the yellow and blue components, whilst V describes the balance between the cyan and magenta components. Colour Fettel allows these parameters to be very precisely adjusted. Define Colour Fettel graphs. To access a particular on the multiple graph display to select it. I have now selected the Y graph. When viewing an individual graph, a number of tools are available. Points can be inserted along the graph. Up to 10 points can be inserted per graph. The points can be moved. The default value for the graph is that of a curved profile. This can be changed by selecting straight and pressing on an individual point. To make the whole graph straight, select straight all. To return these to a curve, select curved all. Individual points can be deleted by selecting DEL and pressing on the required point. DEL ALL returns the graph to normal and reveals all points entered by the user. Z allows the zoom function for precise adjustment of the graph. Pressing again on Z returns to the normal display. C activates the colour point display. I will describe colour point in more detail later. The Y graph is the first graph in the set and this controls the overall luminance of the video image. By moving the white end of the graph down I adjust the luminance of the whites, re reducing the overall brightness of the image. By taking the black end of the graph and pulling it up towards white, we increase the luminance level of the blacks, resulting 
in a brightening of the image. By selecting a point between two nodes, we can selectively adjust the brightness of an individual range of grey tones. The next graph describes U, which is the balance between the yellow and blue components of the video image. By selecting the white end of the graph and pulling it towards blue, the brighter colours become more blue. By selecting the black end of the graph and pulling it towards yellow, the darker areas of the picture become more yellow. In this way, individual brightness ranges can be colour casted to blue or yellow. The V graph allows us to apply the same effect with the cyan and red components of the video image. Selecting the blacks and dragging them towards red makes the blacks more red. Conversely, taking the whites towards cyan has the opposite result. If the graph obscures any part of the image, this can be dragged freely around the screen. Graphs number two and three work together as a pair, allowing the luminance component of the image to be adjusted in U or V. The next pair of graphs work in exactly the opposite way. These control the brightness of the U and V components of the image. So if I select this graph and drag the yellows towards white, the yellow components of the image will become brighter. If I drag the blue component towards black, the blues become darker. The second graph in this pair is graph number seven, which controls the brightness of the V channel. I'm now going to enter a point in the centre of the graph, select straight, all, and adjust only the brightness of the cyan component of the video image dragging it towards white results in the cyan becoming brighter dragging it towards black makes the cyan component darker because there is a straight line on the other side of the graph the reds remain unaffected so the second set of graphs graphs number four and seven allow us to adjust the brightness of U and V. The third pair of graphs control saturation of each individual color channel. The first graph in this pair is graph number five. This controls saturation in U. I'm going to enter a point in the middle of this graph, select straight, all, and drag 
the blue component towards the centre. I have now removed the blue component of the video image, desaturating all of the blues. By taking hold of the yellow end of the graph and dragging that towards the centre, I can desaturate the yellows. So now we see there is no colour in the U component of the video image. If I drag the blue component towards yellow and the yellow component towards blue, I have achieved a hue rotation of 180 degrees in the U component only. The second graph in this set is graph number 9. Graph number 9 controls the saturation of the V channel. In a similar way, by entering a point at the centre, selecting straight all, I can now control the relative saturation of the red and cyan components of the video image by dragging red to the centre I can desaturate red, and by doing the same to cyan, I can desaturate cyan. By dragging cyan towards red, I can achieve a hue rotation. The last pair of graphs in colour fettle are the hue rotation graphs. The first graph in this set is graph number 6. This allows, for example, the blue component of the video image to be rotated towards red at one end of the graph or cyan at the other end of the graph. The yellow component can also be dragged towards red or towards cyan. The second graph in this set is graph number 8. This allows hue rotation in V. Here the red component of the image can be dragged towards yellow or blue while the cyan component of the image can be dragged towards blue or yellow. So to summarise, graph number one allows the adjustment of overall luminance. Graphs number two and three are a pair allowing the luminance value to be adjusted in U and V. Graphs number 4 and 7 are a pair, allowing the U and V components luminance values to be adjusted. Graphs number 5 and 9 are also a pair, allowing the saturation of the yellow and blue components of U and the red and cyan components of V to be adjusted. Graphs number 6 and 8 form the final set allowing U and V components of the image to be hue rotated. Up to 10 points can be entered on each graph.
This means that theoretically, 90 simultaneous selective colour corrections can be applied in one pass. The process of selective colour correction is made simpler with the addition of colour point. Pressing on the colour point box opens the colour point menu. I'm going to select the input colour by highlighting in and pressing on the video image. I'm now going to go to the U saturation graph. By hitting C, I can turn on the colour point display. The intersection of the white line with the black line of the graph indicates precise point at which the selected colour sits on this graph. So to adjust only this colour, I can lock off points either side of that colour, select straight all, and now insert a curve point at the intersection of the colour point and graph display. By pulling the selected colour towards the zero saturation line, I can achieve a selective desaturation of the selected blue component. To desaturate all of the colours above the selected value, I lock off the point and pull down the end of the graph. I now insert another point below, select straight and pull that point down to zero saturation. Now all of the blues above the selected blue are desaturated. Colour point out works in the opposite way to colour point in. A horizontal white line intersects with the black line on the graph to indicate the position of the destination colour. I'm now going to select my out colour. See how the horizontal line moves to indicate the position of the colour I require. I'm now going to use the U hue rotation graph, lock off two points either side of my selected colour, straighten all the points and pull my selected colour down towards cyan. We can now see the blue component of the image being pushed towards cyan. I now need to adjust the blue saturation graph. Here is the in colour, here is the out colour. So once again I lock off points on either side of the selected colour, straighten the points and drag the selected colour to the required location. Here is my input colour at this point on the graph. It's now been colour corrected to match the output colour. In this way, colour point directs us how to adjust the fetal graphs to achieve the required result. Let's look at a real example.
in this shot, I want to increase the saturation of the flowers. I'll now use my in on color point together with the C display on the graph to show me where this color sits on all of my color fettle graphs. I'm also going to mark where grey sits. Turning colour point off and on refreshes the display. So I'm now going to increase the saturation of the reds. I create one point and lock off the points on either side. To get some curvature in the effect, I'm going to make the point that I'm going to adjust curved. And now push that towards higher red saturation. In this example, I'm going to use colour fettle to create two simultaneous selective colour corrections. First, I'm going to select the yellow roses. By turning on C, I can see where that yellow sits on my graph. I'm now going to lock off points either side, straighten the points, make my selected colour point curved and push that up towards red. As a result, the yellow roses become orange. In the same pass, I want to make these blue flowers disappear. So I'll find the position of the blue, lock off points either side, straighten all, make my selected colour point curved and pull that towards yellow. As I add more yellow, the blue becomes green and the flowers disappear. We're now going to take a look at HAL's advanced keying facilities. Selecting the keyer gives us a different keyer menu. There are two basic types of keying available, as indicated by the scroller bar here. There is linear or chroma keying. Chroma keying more closely resembles the traditional HAL keyer, and I'll deal with that first. We notice that there are three modules to the keyer. The main, spill and additive modules. It's the main keyer that cuts the stencil. To key something out, we select the minus button and press down on the screen. To progressively add more and more pixels selected by the pen to the key channel. Softness increases the bandwidth, effectively adding more and more pixels to that key.
where a background has been set, we can preview that key over the background. By pressing Hycon, a black and white mat is displayed. Alternatively, press button 2 on the grip to turn the Hycon on and off. We now have a basis for our key. But we can see elements of coloured spill around the edges of the foreground in these fine hairy areas here. The spill module of the Kia allows chroma spill components to be removed. Spill works in one of three ways. The first is mix and this is similar to the traditional HAL Kia. Using Minus, we can select areas of colour which we want to mix with the background. Mix works together with the softness that is applied and in the areas where softness applies it mixes through the background video. The spill key can be turned on and off by pressing in the box next to spill. It's also helpful sometimes to turn off the main key so we can now see a preview of the spill key together with the mixing which is applied. The second method for spill correction is chroma fix. Hit fix, select a colour, place it in the colour pot and the areas where the spill key applies are colour corrected to match the colour in the pot. We can demonstrate this by putting a very bright colour into the colour pot and we can see the spill key working around the edges. I'm going to put grey into the fixed colour pot to desaturate the edges. The third method for spill correction is fettle. We can use the RGB controls to remove colour components from the area of spill. So in this case I've removed the blue. If I increase the green once again we can see the effect more clearly. We can also use the graphs within Fettel. For example the blue saturation graph. The third key module is additive. Additive is designed for keying difficult subjects like smoke, water, bubbles and so on. Here I'm going to set the background, here I have a clip of some smoke shot against black. I'm going to take that shot into the keyer. I'm going to reset all so that I can begin again. I'm now going to turn on the additive key and go into the additive menu. We can now see that the smoke is added to the level of the background video image. The black produces no change and luminance values above black 
produce an equivalent change. The second type of keyer available to us under advanced effects is the linear keyer. This is activated by using the scroller bar and selecting linear key. A set of defaults are supplied for blue, green, red and black screen. The blue screen presets that I'm using here give a good starting point for the key. To precisely adjust the key however, reset all the values in the keyer and examine the icon. We go to the main keyer and select the area of the image we want to key out with minus. Then we select the area of the image we want to key in with plus and drag the pen over that area. When the inside of our mat is solid, we can proceed by turning off Hycon and examining the background. In the same way, we can use Spill To reset any of the key modules, select Reset and press on that key module. In keying this shot, I have lost a little bit of the fine detail at the edge of this cactus. Some of the very fine hairs have disappeared. We can retrieve that lost detail by using the WISP function of the additive keyer. I'm going to turn on the additive key, which gives a conventional additive key, adding all values above the key level to the background. By turning on WISP and selecting the background colour, pressing in the area which is to be keyed out, I can restore the lost detail in the key. We can see this by turning additive on and off. I'm now going to reset my keyer and move to a green screen shot. Once again select linear key and the green screen values. I'm now going to adjust the main keyer using values. A scroller bar allows us to adjust the values in different colour spaces. In YUV, RGB, Luma and colour difference. I'm now going to use the colour difference sliders to adjust the threshold on my key. I'm going to use a diagram to explain the colour difference controls. I'm going to have a grey background and I'm going to key off the blue in this gradient. So once again I return to blue screen, linear key. This gives me my default key values. The blue minus green parameter adjusts the softness of the key where blue meets red. Conversely the blue minus red parameter adjusts the softness of the key where blue meets green. We can see this by scrolling the values. A smaller difference between the two numbers means 
a harder key. A smaller difference between the two numbers in the blue minus green parameter box results in a harder key where the blue meets red. A bigger difference brings back more of the magenta resulting in a softer key. Conversely, a smaller difference in the blue minus red parameter values results in a harder key where blue meets green. This is the softness of cyan. I'm now going to pull a quite a challenging key on this shot of a dandelion. I'm going to set my background and take my dandelion shot into the linear keyer. Straight away I have a good basis for a key, but I'm going to reset those values Turn on my icon, key out, and key in. I'm now going to turn off the icon and look at the key on the background. I need to key more, so I'm going to key more in with the background in vision. I've keyed more of my foreground in, but as a result, I've got some spill. I'm now going to use the spill keyer to remove that. So I say less of this colour, and using the blue slider, I'm just going to remove the blue component from the spill area. By pressing Hycon, we can view the spill key. This is the area which is being color corrected to remove blue spill. Finally, to maintain the detail of these very fine hairs, I'm going to use the additive module of the keyer. I turn the additive key on, go into the additive menu, sample the background colour and WISP retrieves some of the lost detail of the foreground. The advanced effects menu brings some enhancements to the speed and functionality of blur. I'm going to open up the Blur menu. By selecting the Blur Amount box, I can scroll the blur up and down. As we can see, a far greater degree of blur can be applied than in the traditional HAL Blur menu. In addition, the aspect can be adjusted. Increasing the aspect applies the blur only to the horizontal plane. Taking the aspect into negative numbers confines the blur to the vertical plane. An aspect value of zero means the image is blurred both in the horizontal and vertical planes. We can separate the blur function into the chroma or luma channels only. Pick removes the edge artifacts where a background colour is used. And the blur can be cropped against the background colour.
Directional blur can also be applied. Using the direction arrows, we can set the direction of the blur. Uni controls whether you're blurring into or out of the current position. This is useful when using the blur to track moving objects, such as a bouncing ball. Blur can also be applied to specific areas of the image dependent on stencil value or luminance. If I apply this black and white image as a stencil to the clip I wish to blur and turn on lens, we can see that the stencil value affects the amount of blur that is applied to the image. We can see this more clearly by looking at the image itself. Using the self box, turning on self means that the luminance value of the image as opposed to the key value will determine the amount of blur that is applied. So here we can see that the brighter the image becomes, the more blur is applied. Changing the balance reverses this effect. With the balance set to minus 100, lighter parts of the image remain sharp, whilst the darker parts become more blurred. A balance of zero applies the blur uniformly. The K-low and K-high parameters adjust the threshold above which the blur is applied. I'm now going to blur this shot to provide a background. We notice the blur effect is applied significantly faster. I'm now going to set the blurred image as a background and do one final key, once again with a rather difficult subject. So I return to the main keyer, turn on my Hycon, key out, and key in. So we can now see the preview of the foreground over the background. I'm now going to adjust spill to remove blue. Add a little bit of red and now turn on the additive module of the Kia. Once again using the WISP function, I'll sample the chroma key colour and adjust the amount of WISP. And here's the finished result. In this topic, I'll be using all of Hal's features in combination to form a title sequence.
let's have a look at that sequence in a little more detail because we can see I've got the rushes here to actually start compositing the shot. But as you can see, I've only got the second clip at the beginning here, so I need to go back to my rushes and bring that back in. So go to Record VTR, and you can see I've got control of my tape, and there's the shot that I need. So I could actually crash record the clip in just by selecting play about five seconds before the clip starts and then pressing on now and that will automatically fetch uh, the clip in for me tap down when you want to stop the machine and if I go back to my desk you can see there the clip is ready to be cut so I'd have to snip off the beginning and the end however a better method if you know the time code for the shot would be to say tap in the time code and I've got a note of it here and then select how many frames um, you want that clip to be over so in this instance 110 frames and that automatically puts my out point 110 frames further on in the tape just press do clip and that will bring all of that uh, clip in for me and I won't actually have to cut it together then So once that clips in, we can go back to the desk and add that to the rest of the reel. Also, I need to go and select a soundtrack, and I'm going to bring that in as a backing track because it's not associated with a clip. So if we go to Record from VTR, and I'm going to go to Backing, and to the point where the sound starts. So here's the music. And again, I'm going to select an endpoint. And an out point. So it's over 1,041 frames in this instance. So just select backing and do clip. So literally, it's just bringing in the soundtrack for me so that I can go and edit any clip. Over that, sh over that track. So going back to the desk, we can now hear the backing track with our new clip and the subsequent clip. You can already see that that is actually out of sync so turn off backing for a second and we can see here that we've got slightly too much on the shot that I've brought in. So I'm just going to go and pull my tails just to bring back that edit point That's slightly better there, but it's still fairly harsh. So what I'll do is apply a mix to that edit point. So by using a mix, I'm going to have to pull back my tails even further. Let's review that shot. And we can slightly bring in um, the incoming shot, just delay that slightly more. Let's play that edit back with the sound. Great, now for the next um, part within the sequence, we've got a shot here um, of one of our characters in uh, this children's series and you can see there there's a reflection on his glasses and we've actually added that in later. So 
If we go to the original shot, you can see here we've got um, the clip without the reflection. And if we go to the subsequent clip, we can actually start to see where that reflection came from. So what I need to do is go back to my rushes and actually discount the sparkly effect around the ca candle and this background. And what I started off was fairly minimal. So as you can see here, we have the original shot and it's slightly too bright. So I went and color corrected it, just brought the brightness down and added um, a cast of red and green to create this sepia tone. Then I wanted to color correct the flame. So um, going in and keying that flame out and then um, to create this matte and then using that mat and keyframe curves over the top, I've just isolated the flame there. In fact, you could use a cutout just to isolate off that area because the rest of the shot isn't moving. So let's go and um, place that mat run over the color corrected clip. And you can see there that it matches our shot. Go up to effects. We can go into color and just move the timeline along and change the hue rotation. And turn the stencil on, obviously, that's associated with the clip. So at this point, I'm going to use my keyboard and press on B, which means the biggest value. So that's a complete hue rotation there, back to the original color. If I pull the, my timeline backwards, you can see there that it's actually going through all of those colors. I can actually see that keyframe in profile by pressing on this yellow box, and there it is. So I can also go in here and add extra keyframes by pulling this line down and pushing it up. And I can go and save keyframes and restore them at different points. I can um, have even more control over these keyframes because I can make them linear or curved moves. So linear all will make them all uh, linear keyframes. I can also go and have a look at other color, color corrections at the same time, such as saturation and contrast, um, which are in the color menu. Original all, original alls, um, defaults everything. So pulling along that timeline here, you can see that I've got a lot of colors. And once that's processed, we get a shot like this. Now I want to go and use this shot, of course, to actually reflect on the character's glasses. So I just want to bring out the highlights of that shot, just use those. So I'm going to go in and key out the dark areas just so that we're utilizing the light areas. Let's apply some softness to that. And then process that. So once that's processed, you uh, actually have a mat run that you can then use to go and cut out the clip. So we need to go and select the background which is our character with the glasses and cut out our shot. Bring in the background there and I'm just going to size down that cut out. If I go to flat now and into bend I can actually um, make the cut out look as if it's bending according to the contours of the glasses. You need to pull this uh, candle further down to 
the right hand side and of course with any uh, reflection it's always the opposite of the original so we'll spin this in the y-axis a half and also we need to uh, make this semi-opaque let's size it down and position it Actually, before I um, go in and position it I'll add an edge a soft edge you can see there just select that value and increment it and then reposition it let's go and copy that one off and reposition this over the other side and again I'll bring down those luminance values let's say about 70 once you've processed that clip it will look something like this so going back um, to the shot that we looked at um, as the reflection we can also um, go in and montage the background behind the candle so we move further along now and you can see that we've got our original shot with the colour correction to the flame and we need to go and mask off these lighter areas so that we can put those cutouts in the background so I'll go back to the Kia and again just key out those darker areas and then just reverse the stencil and then process it so now we've actually masked off the areas that we don't want to be covered over by the cutouts so once I process that, you can see there the stencil in action. Let's go and cut out the elements. It's a shot of a bear and a carousel. Let's go into paste up and cut that clip out. And my edges are on at the moment, so just turn those off. Bring in my background and size that down. I also wanted the edges to be soft on this bare shot. They're to its maximum, again using B. Um, to bring out the highest uh, factor reposition that up there and also I want to go and bring in the carousel let's reposition that over to the left and just a slight soft edge there and we, I'm going to knock that one um, back to 50% using the stencil here and also I need to go and create a keyframe uh, for that bear so I'm going to go 50 frames into the shot reposition him change them in size and also bring back um, the edges so um, let's bring that back to say 200 I also need to make him disappear completely so I'll go back to my edge and to crop and actually keyframe the crop so um, just by scrolling up the screen 
I can go and increase those crop values and then bring them back down again. So once that's processed, and of course when you're processing field clips, don't forget to turn on fields because these clips are already in field. And uh, the other one should be in field as well, so select, select field for that. And because there's a keyframe involved, select field to go and process it. So once that's processed, we'll get a clip looking like this. And now all we need to do is go and apply the sparkle to the candle. So again, we're going to go and select uh, that mat run that we used earlier to go and color correct the flame and use that over the shot where we got, went and changed the background so that we can use that in transform effects. I'll just wipe the screen now because I want to go and generate um, a star custom brush and I'm going to use my paint box functions um, just lines connected to generate a star brush. So I'm drawing quite roughly here, it doesn't have to be exact in this instance. And I'm going to fill this in and then I'm going to create a high con and cut that shape out. Turn the original edge off and size the star down in one of the axes. So we'll stick that down and then spin it around on all angles and you can see we've got our star beginning to emerge. So once we've uh, generated um, our mat, we can just create a high con of it and cut out all of the, the star and reduce it in size so that we can create it into a custom brush. Let's change the density of it and the spacing. And uh, I'm going to use that custom brush now um, to animate the clip. So you need to select the clip that you want to go and use, then go into effects and into transform. I'm going to turn the picture off so that we can see uh, the matrix of the brush. And I'm going to randomize that brush so that it's got its maximum size variable, so it's 100 um, in this instance. I also uh, want to just isolate the brush to uh, the flame area, so by turning density on, I can just limit uh, where those brushes are. And by pressing on dither, I can actually bring them out of their area a bit more. Let's bring down the pitch just to increase the amount of them. Let's have a look at that in conjunction with the clip. So maybe we need to add a bit more dither and bring down the pitch a bit more. Let's animate that by bringing down the dither to start with. And as you can see, immediately our clip has come to life with these brushes. A 
again, we've got a profile of those keyframes and what they involve. And I'm also going to um, add a field uh, reset on the dither. And this basically enables me to go in and reset every frame so that each star um, actually keeps its position. It literally just changes in size so that it's not it's not so random that we have a really flickered effect. So once that's processed, uh, this is the final result. And really, that, that would have taken a very long time to rotoscope. Let's have a look at the, the next um, clip within the sequence. And we can see here that we have actually rotoscoped this shot just to animate the breath, make it a bit more um, sort of cold and misty. So we've got the original shot here, the rushes, and I'm going to just select the point where I want to start animating his breath. Then I'm going to select the custom brush that um, I just created and I'm going to use all of the colours in my palette to actually animate this character. And We've got here mix, map, cycle to go through those colours and I use size variable and spray. I just press down and start with it. Again, I'm using the button on the right-hand side of the grip just to sell down the current frame and bring up the next frame simultaneously. Let's have a look at the results of that rotoscoping. And I need to animate that a bit further um, just by using an airbrush. So I'll go and select the airbrush, take it back to the point where I want to, st want to start rotoscoping. And by pressing original paint, I can actually default my setting just to. Um, density variable. OK, let's have a look at the final result of that. Let's have a look at this in context with the next clip. And you can see here that um, the flame actually blows out with the breath of the character. So we need to go in and pull that tail back just prior to the point um, of where the flame's actually blown out. Just about there. Let's play that out. And perhaps we'll go and edit this back a bit further as well. That's better. Let's have a look at this clip in slightly more detail because you'll notice that when the flame blows out the text also animates as well so we've got flames rippling almost over the text 
And we've also got this blur on the glow of the text as well round it, the white text. So I'll bring down um, the rushes for that. And we can see here that I've used a custom brush to go and generate this text here. So just to remind you, um, we've got a custom brush on here and it's just made from a simple line and cut out with a bit of um, airbrushing on the edge just to stop that anti-aliasing effect. So I'm going to pull down the distance between those brushes. pull up the density and change the angle and now we're free to actually start drawing with that calligraphy brush once I've um, generated um, that text I went and animated it, so I repeated one frame of that text and then I went in and used smudge and airbrush to then go and animate it just to get these kind of mid-tones and you can see it's already taking the shape and form of a flame. In actual fact I sold the frame and then moved on to the next frame by this stage. Let's have a look at this in conjunction with the colour correction that was finally made on this piece. So I've got a, a palette in the library that suits this very well. So we can see here that uh, this is a, a palette that I've generated and literally it picks up on just those mid-tones in the centre there and highlights them. So if I go into effects now and colour and then map, you can see that automatically they've made them look as if um, the text is on fire. Um, so the final result of mapping um, this animating text looks like this and then in the final thing I went and add, added the sort of metallic text in front of um, that glow so to generate that again I used another palette and I um, cycled through that palette picking up on all the colours to generate a background Let's save that to one of my buffers and then I selected on the original text again, took a hike on of it and then cut it out. I then used that and overlaid it over this glowing text to create this effect and also here and keyed and brought back some of the other flames that were more in the center of the text. If we sh um, have a look at the final sequence again we can see that we've got glowing underneath um, this the white text We've got the original text here and we literally went in and grew the text using it as a stencil of course. This grow only works as a stencil. So let's uh, go in 10 frames into the clip, bring up the grow and then down again at the end you can see there on the preview that it's actually animating. I've got a profile of that keyframe as well. So 
So once I've grown my text, I can go and blur it as well. So using a copy of it again, placing it over itself, each of these functions here have to be processed separately. They don't work simultaneously. So again, pulling that keyframe up and then down again at the end there. And we can see that the blur is also animated as well. In fact, we've got other um, functions within blur now as directional blur, which enable us to sort of blur in one direction. All of, in fact, all directions because um, we're actually animate, able to animate those directions as well. Or streak it, which means that it blurs the whole thing um, both ways. So literally, um, I went in and blur, grew and blurred the shot. Okay, so as you can see here, we used the original text and composited the blurred text underneath. So we've completed our reel, um, and you can see here that I've gone and color-coded and named quite a few of the clips within the reel. And um, the one at the start here needs to be named, so we'll just call it intro. And we'll give it a color as well. So that's ready now to be saved into the library with its title. We also have um, some of the text that we want to go and archive off. So I'll just save that off to the library, find it as a reel, so I'm now going to copy that reel to the VTR and the information is now going to go down to the exchangeable all um, the information about things like um, clip stencils old and new are all retained in the archive so that when you bring everything back in again it remains the same we can see all of our elements going down now. That last one was the mat run um, for the text. So if we go now and look at our exchangeable and find the archive, it's now given the same name as the real title. And we can go and bring that back in again by going copy, VTR and then local. So we're activating the VTR and copying the reel over to the local, selecting the clip archive information. And it's just pre-rolling and then bringing all of those elements in. Now if I go to the library on my local disk, we'll find both of the archives under reel. And you can see that top one is the one that I've brought in as an archive. And if I lift that reel off, tap down on the archived one, you can see that it's actually brought in the clip and the clip stencil over each other, and old and new there have been retained as well. And everything's in the same order, and if I'd pulled some tails, that information would come back as well. Let's have a look at... Um, the title sequence one more time. <laughs> 